welcome to the second lecture on uh, hardware security so as in the last class we were uh, introducing ourselves to the topic of hardware security so i will continue with that and try to see uh, some more implications on hardware security in the present day context so i will start uh, with uh, the elaborations on the concepts that uh, we will be covering in today's lecture so we will be trying to see about uh, root of trust which is uh, one of the final fundamental objectives of hardware security like we try to develop a root of trust uh, using the using the technology of hardware and in this context we will be discussing about something which is called as trusted platform modules or tpms so uh, the uh, we will be also discussing about hardware attacks in this context like some of the attacks which were mounted on tpms and essentially have challenged the opportunities which hardware in general brings in we will be also touching upon side channel analysis and uh, also talk about in general about trust in hardware and finally we will be discussing about a hardware design flow like trying to understand how we can eventually design hardware uh, using uh, using our uh, using our basic cat tools so to start with uh, let us take a look at uh, the, you know like the developing a root of trust which is a very fundamental uh, i would say uh, uh, fundamental objective of bringing in hardware is uh, that we try to uh, we develop a, a, you know like a very minimal uh, component which is called as the root of trust or rot so in this context <coughs> there is a very uh, important uh, objective like you would like for example suppose imagine that you have a computing system and you would like to boot your computing system how do you know that the operating system that you are loading right essentially is trusted because many of the attacks we know essentially which happens on software happens because of the fact is that the operating system is itself compromised so even if you you know like run uh, uh, run your software which essentially has for example cryptography in it right will not be enough because the the os on which the software is executing is itself compromised so in order to address this there is a concept of secure boot which i will try to introduce here so in trusted boot there is a basic component which is which is essentially hardware so the, the, the basic root of trust is hardware and it tries to initiate a chain of trust okay so the idea is that there is a very uh, there is a small component which is essentially your system hardware as shown here uh, it tries to essentially uh, you know like uh, basically what it tries to bring in is it tries to bring in or it tries to uh, develop or basically like this is the starting point of your root of trust okay so it tries to measure or bring in the initial bios code but before it executes the bios code it does a measurement okay so this measurement is trying to understand that whether the bios is bios is legitimate or not okay so what essentially is measurement can be discussed but let us try to get the overall idea okay so so what what we try to do here is or the root of trust or the hardware root of trust tries to do is it tries to initially measure the initial bios code and then uh, so the measurement could typically imply very simply uh, take the program take its configuration and compute a cryptographic hash on it okay so therefore what it tries to do is it tries to um, develop this measurement or calculate this uh, hash 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 output and let's call it as measurement of uh, of the bios okay and once the measurement is done it is appended to a uh, to a chain of trust okay <clears throat> so we append this and if uh, this measurement does not belong to an approved list this approved list is denoted as l star then the process itself halts at that point okay so the process that itself uh, stops at that point and uh, it doesn't allow it to go further on the other hand if the measurement is fine that means if the measured output belongs to an approved list then we continue so then we bring we, then we go into the next layer where we basically so the, the, so now the bios comes into the picture the bios takes control and the bios starts to measure and execute a bootloader okay again the same process continues that means this measurement is done the measurement is appended if the appendment is fine if is appending if the appending is fine then it is allowed otherwise it it holds okay so so finally the operating system comes into the control and uh, the idea is now therefore that uh, if you go behind right if you if you consider this chain of trust then the entire trust is built upon this uh, assumption that the hardware which is your root of trust is pure is essentially trusted okay 
so so that is the uh, that that is essentially the con the reason why you know like hardware is very promising because it can give you a very small component which you can trust okay which you can believe and 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 it and if this fine if, if this works fine right and virtually you have a very low cost and efficient way of building trust to your systems okay so here is a reference which you can look into it uh, gives a very nice description about uh, several other things related to secured boot and also tpms in general okay so uh, so therefore this essentially brings into this concept of trusted platform module or tpm so tpm is basically a technology which uh, essentially right is uh, tries to bring in uh, uh, trust into your system and it's a, it, it's a standard it's a standard uh, st a standard of trying to build in trust in your system using this concept of minimalistic root of trust okay in, which is built in hardware so the idea is that a trust uh, you can there are many definitions of uh, there are many definitions of tpm like here i have enlisted one of the popular definitions which says that a trusted platform module is a computing platform that has uh, you know like a trusted component probably in the form of built in hardware just like what we saw in the previous slide which it uses to create a foundation of trust for your software processes okay so there are different components of a tpm chip for example here is a, a sort of a diagram which tries to capture how a tpm chip, chip looks like so i will just try to show you the most important components so one of them is of course there is a lpc bus so it's a low pin count bus and uh, which essentially does the input output so it does the io with the external world then there is a secure controller so this controller controls the internal tpm execution flow and verifies the command like suppose you give a command to the tpm chip the the commands are often encrypted and they need to be verified to know that they are legitimate commands okay so then uh, there is an eprom which basically stores several keys so in tpm there is a management of several keys okay and i have just enlisted two of the most important ones so one of, so one is called as an endorsement key and the other one is called as a storage key or srk okay and there are also other important keys like owner authorization data and ek certificate which are also maintained and stored inside the tpm okay so you may note here that the ek and the sk or the ek and the srk never actually leaves the ic boundary so this essentially remains embedded and in particular the private component of this so there are so these are typically based on public key cryptography so they have a public key and a private key component the private key components of these keys like the of, of the endorsement key and uh, so on the srk never leaves the ic boundary so it leaves it basically remains inside the tpn chip and is never externally exposed okay so this is a feature of the tpm chip okay and uh, there are some criticism against that also because of the fact that even the user who is using the tpm chip is not aware of these keys okay so this can lead to some privacy allegations and things like that but at least from security point of view this seems to be a very you know like a uh, a, a, a sane solution where the idea is that the chip uh, essentially is kind of storing the secret key and this secret key component is never externally revealed okay so even the user of the tpm chip is not aware of this these keys so that is essentially the basis of uh, this uh, you know like the of the trust which is built using tpms and the tpm right as you understand does lot of cryptographic operations and because of this there are some cryptographic components which are already being inbuilt into the tpm chip okay so for example it has got a support of a 1024 bit or 2048 bit rsa key generation as well as rsa encryption so it can do both key generation as well as uh, encryption okay then there is a sha1 engine so this is a hash engine okay so there is a hash function as i said that when you are doing the measurements you are doing hash computations right so therefore what you are typically doing is that so there is a platform configuration register okay and this stores the you know like st stores the current calculations like the current measurements okay so the measurements are usually done in this way like you take an initial pcr and then you do a hash of a new code so you kind of do something like an iterative hash function so you apply the hash function one after the other and you try to compute this digest and you try to keep it inside your uh, inside your uh, pcr okay so then one of the fundamental requirements of cryptography is that it requires or is based on random number generators okay so therefore the tpm also has got a small hardware or a hardware for doing or calculating what are called as trngs or true random number generations so there is a true random number generator which is inbuilt into this 
Uh, then there is a tick counter which is essentially provides an audit trail of the, all the TPM commands which are arriving at the TPM. And the idea is that this is a very, you know, like a built in very in, with a lot of security features so that you cannot do, you know, like active attacks. So it has got an active shield, it has got voltage fluctuation detections and the high frequency sensors, reset filters and so on. So these are basically I would say more of like safety measurements which are being kept in the TPM chips. Okay. So, uh, so, you know, like having said that TPM is also upgrading. So, the one which I told before was more of like TPM, what is called as TPM 1.2, which is getting upgraded into TPM 2.20 and note that TPM 2.0 is not backward compatible, but TPM 2.0 comes up with many other algorithms. Okay. For example, it has got support of not only RSA, but it has also got support of elliptic curve crypto systems, which supports like NIST P256, baritonetic curves. These are different forms of curves which we need not, uh, you know, like which we will probably see at least some of them in our future classes. But as I mentioned you in the previous class also, like elliptic curve crypto is a very popular uh, and efficient way of developing public public key cryptography and TPM 2.0 apparently also supports uh, the ECC. Then the, then the SHA-1 is of course there and also it has got extended to SHA-256 which is an improved, watch, improved hash function okay, or a modern hash function. Then there is a support of a 128-bit AES encryption and along with this there are several other algorithms which are also defined in the specifications of TPM 2.0. So here is a reference if you are interested from Wikipedia about how TPM 1.2 compares with TPM, TPM 2.0. But having said that, I mean the point which I want to kind of you know like hit upon here is that in, in, spite, in spite of this you know like there have been reports of several hardware attacks on TPMs. Okay? So I have just enlisted two of the very important attacks. One of them was told in 2010 where researchers at Black Hat showed how to extract secrets from a single TPM by inserting a probe and spying on the internal bus of an Infineon chip okay, which has got TPM. So basically they probed the bus and found out the secrets okay. and as I said that if those secrets like EK and so on and, and SRK are revealed then the entire trust collapses. Okay. Likewise, in 2015, there was an attack on a power attack. So, this is a side channel attack okay? and we will be studying how or what, how, what differential power attack sees and how it works. So, if the, so, the idea is that a DPA essentially was mounted to extract the secret keys. Okay? So, this shows that even if you know like you have a nice architecture like TPM, the idea of storing secrets is not a very uh, I would say safe and secure means okay? because there can be potential attacks. At the same time, it also tells us that we should build our crypto systems or crypto hardware with these kind of physical attacks in mind, like with this kind of side channel attacks in perspective. So this brings us to the you know like topic on hardware attacks. So basically, what I try to what I'm trying to say is that you know like although hardware comes up with lot of uh, 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 you know like lot of uh, advantages, uh, and it basically rules out several attacks on the software, but then there are some challenges on its own which were <coughs> which which are essentially challenges because of its nature of being hardware okay so for example right uh, you know like when you talk about hardware you can actually monitor several analog signals for example you can mon mon monitor the time time taken of course like it is there in even in software implementations but you know like uh, if there are time variations for example if you have say a sequential circuit which you have implemented and the output comes up uh, depending upon the input Okay. So, uh, so then you know like you can Im immediately do, do, few do few attacks. Okay. Likewise, the power consumptions, electromagnetics, sound, etc. all of them can be potentially used to attack. Okay. So, for example, you can probably appreciate this point that when you try to do traditional hardware design, you try to minimize power. Okay. But when you are trying to develop secure hardware, your objective may be you know like maybe not that, maybe, maybe rather than you know of course you have to minimize power, but what is more important is that you have to make or ensure that the power consumption does not vary with your inputs. Okay? Because if it varies, then the attacker can catch those variations and from there can try to obtain the, uh, obtain the secrets. Okay? Likewise, you know like you can do physical attacks like fault attacks for example, where you can part of the environment you can put up the voltage fluctuate you can put up the voltage you can create temperature fluctuations you can take uv light you can use x rays lasers and so on to create bit flips in your circuit okay and we will see later on you know in our discussions how you can use faults effectively to get the secret keys in with very less effort okay likewise you can also do invasive attacks you can probe data and you can modify circuit so in this context there is a technology which is called as focused ion, ion beam or fib 
which can actually create test points and even modify the chip structure okay, from the rear side of the chip and thus it can overcome sophisticated top metal mesh protections and sensors like you may have in the top layer like you may have mesh protections you may have protections against attacks but the attack essentially takes care from the rear side from the rear structure and these are you know like extremely sensitive and powerful equipments which are expensive no doubt but they are definitely feasible okay and therefore right we need to take care of these kind of hardware attacks when we are designing our secure systems so hardware security bridges the gap between theory and practice for sure you know like uh, as, as i said that you know like cryptographic theory has limitations because cryptographic theory uh, often doesn't address the real world okay and uh, there is an absence of theory for the reality because of which even mathematically strong ciphers can leak in the real world so you may take a nice aes algorithm or an rsa algorithm or an ecc algorithm but when you implement them right because of this leaked information through what are called as side channels which may be intentional or it may be unintentional the secrets can be compromised okay so therefore what we need to do is that we need to understand this gap between theory and practice okay so therefore right uh, there are several goals which we will be trying to address in our course in due, uh, due time is that we, we of course need to take care of performance which is like one of the most important reasons why we have hardware because we want to make our designs more efficient. So we want to of course take care of speed, clock frequency, latency, do fast arithmetic, okay? bring in parallelism in our computations. Okay? But at the same time of course like we have, we have to also take care of some other things. Okay? The another very important thing which is of importance in more probably in today's world when we talk about internet of things and cyber physical systems is that we need to make our designs lightweight. So we need to, need to make our designs consume less area, take low power, take low energy and so on. But even with this kind of constraints, right, we cannot compromise on security because if security is compromised then the entire technology will collapse. Okay? So we need to take care of side channel attacks, fault attacks. And also countermeasures, like when we build in countermeasures, as we will be seeing in the class, they are extremely, they have, uh, over, they have a high overhead. Okay? So we need to try to ensure that the countermeasures are light and they, are, can, they can be utilized for IoT kind of subsystems. So uh, I will, you know, in the remaining part in today's class, I will be trying to tell you about how we can actually develop hardware. Okay? So, of course, there are different ways of designing hardware, like there are application specific integrated circuits, ASICs, which may be costly. Okay? There is another competing technology, which is called as the FPGA, which we will be trying to kind of, uh, you know, like focus in our class. Okay? For example, an FPGA stands for what is called as a field programmable gate array. So, it is a very interesting technology, which is basically comprised of an, or an array of logic cells, which are connected by routing channels. Okay? So the idea is that as I, if you go into the name of FPGA, you will see that there are certain important parts. Okay? One of the interesting part is this programmability. Okay? So it says that it is programmable. So it is a hardware which is programmable. We know that our general purpose computers, we have, when we have general purpose computers, when we write programs on them, then it is programmable. Right? So you can write any program. You can write today bubble sort, tomorrow quick sort on the same architecture. Okay? Likewise, in an, when you talk about FPGAs, you can actually reconfigure it. So you can reconfigure an adder and to maybe work tomorrow as a multiplier. Okay? That is the biggest advantage of an FPGA. So you can actually do an in-house design. You can do a design inside your house, inside your lab environment. And you can go from your basic conception of the design to the final execution okay? in situ, in your lab. And uh, you know, like because of this, the, the technology is imp interesting because the technology you will see has got an array of logic cells which are connected via routing channels. There are special I/O cells, and the logic cells are typically what are called as LUTs. So these LUTs are uh, essentially you know like the fundamental blocks of FPGA. So let us take a look about how an, or uh, how an FPGA uh, you know like looks like. So here, uh, before that, you know uh, here I have uh, uh, kind of enlisted some applications of FPGAs. For example. Uh, I, th I think that one of the biggest advantages of FPGA is to prototype. Like before you are going into commercial deployment of an ASIC, as I said that ASIC is costly, you would like to prototype your design. You would like to see that whether your design at all works, or, or works fine or not. And there, there is a huge application of FPGAs. Okay? And, the less, and, and the production cost is less because the, there is a very le less time to market. You can get better performance uh, 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 and, and, and the modern FPGAs are improving in leaps and bounds. So the bridge or the gap between ASICs and FPGAs is also, you know, like getting uh, lesser and lesser. So our FPGAs nowadays are pretty advanced. So you can really develop, I would say, competing technologies on FPGAs as well. 
okay because of various dedicated blocks that they have like dsp blocks multipliers and so on another thing as i already said is that uh, it's reconfigurable so you can also do you know like you can make the same hardware uh, to reconfigure and also you can reconfigure on the fly so with techniques like partial reconfiguration you can actually do dynamic reconfiguration okay and that is a huge advantage which fpgas brings in okay particularly in the context of things like iot and uh, those kind of things where you probably need to change things very f rapidly then also you can develop special purpose computing platform so for example dedicated to solve one problem and this is exactly where you can bring in crypto because in crypto right you need to solve dedicated problems and therefore in this context you can try to bring in or develop fpg accelerators okay so let us take a look about uh, okay so before that here is a classic example of a des cracker so uh, this is th this design is called as copagobana so all, many of you know probably know about the des or the data encryption standard so in 1998 a custom hardware was uh, was developed to develop an attack on this and you can see the cost it was something like dollar 250000 to build and uh, and decrypt des cipher in 56 hours later on in 2006 there was an effort which was called as copagobana which stands for cost optimized parallel code breaker which was built and it was uh, built on uh, commercially available reconfigurable integrated circuits and the cost reduced to something like dollar 10000 and decreased des cipher in around 6.4 days okay so the cost decreases by roughly a factor of 25 okay so if you just adjust for inflation over 8 years so you can see that even uh, you can see the improvement is probably in around 30x okay now since 2007 there have been several efforts so for example this is an example of a spin off company which tries to develop successors of copagobana and one of the success of copagobana is called as riveda okay and it reduces the time to break des to the current record of less than one day using 128 spartan 3 fpgas okay. so this is an interesting example and this is a wikipedia link where you can go and see how fpgas can be used to develop custom attack hardwares okay so that you know like so this, here is a photograph of how the copagobana looks like okay and you can see it's like made up of uh, nice structures we are built around fpgs so here is a diagram about how an fpg architecture looks like so this architecture is what is called as the island architecture so in this architecture you will see that there are some io blocks so these input output blocks are located around the periphery of the core of the chip and the objective of an io block is just to uh, develop connectivity of the chip that means the chip tries to communicate with the external world through these io blocks okay the other important block is the logic block so this logic block is where your logic resides okay so this logic block is compromised of what are called as clbs or configurable logic blocks which are in turn made up of what are called as lut's or lookup tables okay so in general this architecture may vary from slide to slide from vendor to vendor but more or less this is how it looks like okay so you have got the logic blocks and these logic blocks essentially are uh, interconnected with i mean they are interconnected with each other they are in, interconnected with the power, with, with the with, with, with the um, with the lines around and for that you also have got special blocks so these blocks are what are called as the switch blocks and the connection blocks so if you see this diagram you will see that there are two important routing uh, points okay and they are all switches okay so for example this is this logic block is connected to these rails okay and these uh, these are essentially what are called as the connection blocks for example if you see this logic block it is connected uh, with these rails or the wire segments around the clbs they are connected by programmable switches okay so you have got programmable switches which you can configure to get connected okay likewise right if you take uh, the wires in adjacent channels like this channel and this channel they are connected here by what are called as switch blocks okay so these are nothing but interconnection logic or interconnection switches which you can program so for example if i want to turn on a switch i need to say you know like program one over there whether you know if i want to turn off that switch i will program it by zero so it's basically using switches uh, or maybe digital switches to be more precise okay so at the end of the day what you are trying to do is that you have a design and your, and your tool right will give you a zero one pattern which is often called as a bit file and you take that bit file and the bit file configures these switches okay and therefore right the fpj gets reconfigured and not only the switches but also your lookup table okay and uh, your entire structure gets reconfigured to work as you wish okay or as you as you intend so here is an how the internal of the clb so this is slightly an uh, on an on an older fpga so but but i think the idea remains the same 
So you will see that in the CLB there is a block which is called as the LUT or the lookup table. Okay. So this lookup table typically always have a fixed number of inputs. So the number of inputs here are designated as 4. Okay. In modern FPGAs you may probably see it go up to 6. Okay. So there was an older work where people try to do lot of uh, you know like uh, explorations trying to find out that what should be the size of this input of the LUT. Okay. Whether it should be 4, 5, 6, 8 or so on. So it was found out that if the value is around 4 or 6 right around this point it was found out that the utilization of the lookup tables is maximum okay and therefore right you will see that if you are, when you are realizing boolean functions then uh, most of the fpgas typically have got inputs which are within 4 to 6 okay so therefore i, I, I mean we have the lut block so this lut block can realize any boolean function of four input in this diagram okay if it is 6 then it can realize any boolean function of six input Sometimes in modern LUTs you do not have only one output but you have got two outputs also. Okay. So, but anyway without loss of generality and without uh, losing too much information we can you know like think about this architecture right now where we have one output in the LUT and there are four inputs to this LUT. Apart from this there is also a control and carry logic which is a combination of block which is often a fast carry chain. Okay. And this fast carry chain essentially you know like is used to pass on your input carry to the output. Okay. So now what you can do is you can pass this input carry and calculate the output and from there you will get uh, a fast carry chain. So for example right if you are trying to implement an adder for example you know that uh, the biggest uh, hurdle of implementing an adder is a carry chain. So you can actually implement an adder nicely in this structure where the lookup table does your other computations but the carry chain is a dedicated uh, path okay, which, is a, which is much faster than your other LUT uh, blocks. You also have uh, you know like a flip flop which is essentially supposed to provide you support for the sequential logics. So you can see that you have got support for combinational logics and sequential logics in together you can actually realize our this basically func functions as your basic logic block. Okay. So, uh, so, so that this is how the design flow looks like. So the design flow you will see has got or it starts with uh, you know like uh, what is called as an RTL description. So you start with an RTL description, you have got a design and you start with a basic RTL. So you can implement your RTL uh, using say Verilog or VHDL or some other uh, languages but typically Verilog is a very standard language which is adopted. Then you put, uh, you know like pass that to a ca several CAT tools, again you have got several CAT tools like you have got Xilinx and uh, uh, you know like uh, these, so these are like I have just written more here about the FPGA tools which are used but if you go into the ASIC world then there are other tools like which are designed by Cadence and Synopsys. Uh, so, so, so if you the idea is that you basically do an implementation here so you, the implementation will include blocks like placement and routing and finally the bitstream generation and once the bitstream generation is done you essentially can download that bitstream through a port which is often the JTAG port and you can configure the FPGA to work as you wish. Okay. So you basically can reconfigure the, the FPGA. So this is how the overall design flow looks like and uh, what I will try to you know like show you uh, uh, was one of the sample boards which you can probably try to get access to it is a relatively low cost FPGA device which is called as a Nexus 3 board and uh, you know like we can actually so this is the FPGA inside the board and what we will be trying to do is we will be trying to program this FPGA using our design and uh, typically uh, and, and, and reconfigure it to work as we want. So, uh, so, so I will take a simple design problem and try to show or illustrate about how and uh, how, how basically the, we, can, we can do design on these FPGAs. Okay. So to start with uh, you know like you can take a 2 bit adder. So your objective is to build this logic of A is equal to A plus B. So if you when you want to do that your starting uh, thing is writing uh, or developing a design file. So this design file is often described in Verilog. Okay. So I am not going into the syntax of Verilog because that maybe you can look into your yourself. So there is a module description inside that you develop the logic for the adder. Okay. Once you have developed that adder you take it through a flow. So here is a Xilinx design flow here you, you can choose the target uh, FPGA write the corresponding family device package and other stuff and then uh, you can actually pass it through some sequence of steps okay. and uh, finally you will get the bit file. Okay. So the bit file. Uh, so the so the bit so the, here is your adder logic. You also want to test your design. So you want to know that whether your design is correct or not. So the usual way of doing that is by writing what is called as a test bench. 
So you write a corresponding test bench of your uh, adder. So you, if you see the test bench, right? I mean, again, without going to the syntax, you basically instantiate the adder, which means you kind of can send inputs to the adder, and uh, the input sequence is denoted here. So you are basically giving stimuli to your adder. So you are giving say a 00, 0 as an input or a 1 1 or 1 3 as input and so on. Now this adder will essentially give you the corresponding output, and you can actually verify whether your adder is correct or not. So usually what you do initially is you do a simulation. So you basically do a simulation which is called as a behavioral simulation and gradually as you go down the design cycle you do more and more accurate simulations. Okay. So uh, there is another when you are trying to really port this design onto the FPGA you also have to do what is called as a user constant file or UCF where you have to describe the how the, the interconnection between the FPGA and your uh, Verilog code. For example, the Verilog that I wrote has inputs like A0, A1, B0, B1, S0, S1 and S2. So, these are the outputs of the adder. You can actually tie it to the FPGA pins by, by, the, by this LOC configurations. Okay? So, for more descriptions, you can actually look into the Nexus 3 board uh, manual. From there, you can actually get these descriptions and accordingly, you can write the corresponding UCF file. Once you have done that, you can go into the implement and press synthesis step and automatically your tool will go through a bunch of steps. Okay? And uh, these steps essentially I have got several uh, important components. The first important component is that it does an RTL design, uh, so like you already done this RTL design. Once you have done uh, this, uh, uh, you know, like the, the next step which is done is what is called as an RTL elaboration. So, in RTL elaboration, what is done is that it basically infers your design into data path components okay, or control path components. So, data path components are essentially realized by special components which are internal to the FPGA and the control path gets elaborated into either an FSM or some Boolean logic. Okay. So, there are several optimizations which are done. Some of the optimizations are architecture independent. That means, uh, they are done by usual compiler optimization techniques like constant propagation, strength reduction, expression optimizations, whereas the control paths are optimized by FSM encoding and state minimization. So, and on the other hand, uh, the next steps which are done are more specific to the FPGA, where you actually do a mapping. So, the mapping is where you basically take various elements of the design and you optimally assign to FPGA resources. So, the FPGA resources. Uh, essentially, you know, like the data, are typically like the data path elements gets inferred to adders, multipliers, and memory elements, and the control paths are realized in the FPGA blocks and uh, in the FPGA logic block often. Okay, so the optimizations are often depend on the FPGA fabric, like the LUT structure, like whether it is for four, four input LUT and so on. Then it is followed by two important steps, which are called as placement and routing, and finally you get the bit stream. Okay. The once you have got the bit stream, that is the final step because the bit stream takes the routed design as input and produces a bit stream which programs the logic and interconnects. Okay. As I said that the, all of them are programmable, so you can program and everything is a switch and therefore in this uh, you, you can actually program them either turn on or turn off the switches. So finally, you open the tool from uh, ADAPT. So this, there is just an example, but you can do it with other tools as well. So then you know like you basically. Uh, download this bit file and finally your design works as intended. Okay. So reference, you can actually take a look at this book, you will find more details about how uh, you know like the design uh, works and how, uh, how these designs can be made. And this is a uh, standard reference which you will be trying to follow in most parts of the class, although we will try to use some other materials as well. So what we have discussed in today's class is we have discussed about TPM which is a hardware security core processor to work as a root of trust. Okay, and the hardware attacks uh, and we just say that even when we are using hardware then still attacks are possible in the form of specialized hardware attacks we are often called as side channel attacks. FPGAs provide a reconfigurable platform for hardware design so it is very handy in, you know, not only to understand designs but also to really develop applications using a, a, for hardware and the FPGA design flow typically takes the RTL description which is often done using languages like Verilog which are high level description or hardware description languages which are high level languages and finally you take it to the prototype uh, and the prototype is usually done in the form of bit file. So you create a bit file and then you download that into your design and your design starts working. Okay. So with this I would like to come conclude this uh, part of the class and uh, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, we will take the next class where we will be trying to look more into hardware designs.